if you're talking about commercial galleries, I think have uh, an incredibly important role in relation to the support and development of artists. Of course, it's a relatively tiny percentage of artists, as we know, that are commercially represented. I mean, really tiny, probably less than 1%. I mean, a lot less than 1%, I would say. So uh, they, don't, um, uh, they don't extend that benefit across artists more generally. But as you say, there are lots of other ways in which artists have opportunities through prizes and residences and awards and com other commissioning opportunities that are really valuable. But I actually think commercial galleries, because they have long-term relationships with the artists that they represent, unlike say, if you like, a one night stand that somewhere like Modern Art Oxford would have, they really do provide, it's a really important um, mechanism for the support, not just the financial support of artists, but also the development of their, of their practice. And, and of course they play a really important role in their relationships with institutions in bringing them to a relationship to wider audiences as well. So I actually think that commercial galleries um, uh, are incredibly important uh, in their relationships with artists. I think institutions are very important in their relationships with audiences mm -hmm. So, If I were, I think there can be a binary sometimes between this idea of the public and the commercial, you know, that I know from my own reality is it's a very symbiotic um, relationship, a much more interesting and more complex relationship within the visual arts ecology and, and of course the economy because many, commercial galleries enable financially the, 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 the visibility of their artists mm -hmm. in institutional spaces. Uh, that's really important. So, um, and I think that's been changing. I think these relationships are very dynamic and I think they're, they're changing all the time in really interesting ways. Mm, so I wonder what do you then, what are you then able to do to, to go beyond the one night stand? Is then your role really really the public? I would I would say again we'll want to avoid these. But I set up a very binary analogy there, which is which we probably want to dispense with. But I think that uh, we have a responsibility to um, give visibility a platform to support the practice of artists, mm -hmm. and that's really at the core of our mission. Uh, but we also have to combine that with the with um, our mission for audiences and um, the education of audiences, um, but also the increasingly the activation, the, the participation the, um, of, of participants uh, mm -hmm. and audiences. And I think, I think many public institutions are, I refer to it as this participatory turn, are moving much more towards being much more co-creative, um, co-authored, participatory inclusive spaces because of the the environment in which we're all operating which has radical consequences of course not only for artists but but for curators and other practitioners that work with um uh, with artists so we um we we have to there are many many artists i would love to show up at oxford but i don't think that they're as as impactful for our audiences so um, we sort of have to get used to setting those preferences aside in order to think about we're working in a very particular context with a demographic, with a, a set of tastes or interests, uh, and, um, uh, and we want to ensure that we are um, fulfilling our artistic mission around internationalism, inclusion, uh, art as a form of... Um, uh, progressive agent of social change, you know, things like this. So, of course, there are many things that we're thinking about in relation to audiences, but they are they are really our bread and butter. But it's interesting that um, obviously you, you're you're acknowledging the importance of private galleries, and and I guess the modern art Oxford doesn't acquire work of artists, does it? It commissions works, right? Yes, that's right. I mean, we're essentially a uh, Kunsthalle. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we don't have a permanent collection. I mean, there's a longer conversation about the aspirations of the organization since its foundation to develop one. It's, it has developed uh, capsule collections over time on the back of its exhibition program, artists donating work. But there's been a variety of different approaches to uh, the development or the um, deaccessioning of those holdings over time, because we've never had a dedicated space to really be able to give the right um, public access to those works and 
uh, the kind of um, what would be assumed conditions for the storage, the security, the public, the scholarly access to those holdings has changed with different directors over, over time. So we don't really define ourselves as having an, a collection, but we think very much of our archive uh, as a collection because we, we describe ourselves as a learning organization and the archive is a very important asset within that as a collection, if that makes sense. Mm. And I guess that also talks about potentially the kind of work that you show because some work is not physical um, and then that opens other opportunities for how the work is preserved or documented. And, yeah, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, we, we of course we're documenting everything within our program all the time. That forms part of the ongoing development of the archive. Uh, but um, but but of course we've been interested in dematerialized strategies in art really since the gallery was founded in the 60s and had a strong interest in in those uh, strategies of artists to avoid the commodification and the the sort of the economic circulation of art as well as its social agency um, that's been a feature within our program really since the very yeah the very early days in the mid 60s when the gallery was founded so when the gallery is founded it was called Modern Art Oxford? No, it was originally called um, the Museum of Modern Art Oxford until actually relatively um, late, uh, uh, till 2002. And the story um, that I was told by Andrew Nairn, who was then the director at the time, was that on the occasion of Tracy Emin's show, uh, they were standing by a poster advertising the show, and Tracy Emin just covered over the Museum of Modern Art Oxford, and it just read Modern Art Oxford. And um, I have to say, it's not really a name that's uh, stuck as well as MoMA Oxford. People still call us MoMA. Mm -hmm. And of course, the idea of the, the, the sort of the idea of the museum has changed enormously beyond the conventional idea of it that I think result was the trigger for changing to modern Oxford. And actually we're much more contemporary art Oxford than we are modern art Oxford. Exactly what I was just about to ask. Uh, I understand that the, the museum has changed uh, what we consider a museum, but what we consider modern has yes. also changed. Yes, yeah, I know. It's a bit of a, it's a little bit of a minefield. I think it, if we changed our name on the basis of every key development in the discourse of, of uh, art history and or contemporary theory, I think we would be changing our, our name quite regularly. Um, having said that, we are we are going to be thinking again about um, uh, the name of the gallery probably next year because we're doing a big project to refurbish things and a reopening. Um, but it's I think it's also practically about man in Oxford where we have you know seven million international tourists a year setting their expectations about what a museum of modern art is. We probably don't really um, fulfill that expectation and it's really about ensuring that when people come they've got a clear idea as to what we are and all of these sorts of things really. Um, so you're not questioning, you're not challenging what modern is or you're not trying to redefine it or, or find another definition for it? I wouldn't say that we're trying to do that in our programme. I think that we're trying to broaden the canon uh, the art historical canon of modernism, without a doubt, in particular, to ensure that, you know, practitioners from the global majority, um, making sure that feminisms are inflected within that story as well. I mean, we did a Ruth Asawa exhibition, for example, last year, which would be a good most recent example of, of really sort of asserting the importance of a figure in that modernism. But a, a lot of our, I would say the, ma the majority of our program is focused really on contemporary postmodern practices, uh, I would say. Um, uh, that, yeah, that's more of our focus rather than modernism per se. Yeah, no, I understand that. And I spoke to, I spoke to, when you were asking me what I've learned, and I spoke to Christine Tierney from New York. She runs a gallery that bears her own name and they, predominantly are interested in time-based media. And speaking to her was very interesting because um, at, she actually was telling me about the Victor Bergen show, which really was the Victor Bergen piece that they've recently recreated, which was this section of a floor being perfectly photographed. And then the photographs of the floor were placed on yeah. the floor. Uh, yeah, the word, yeah. um, 
the story was nice because all the photographs of the previous iteration of that work were black and white because the work had been done in the 1970s and you know all these conversations about whether they should do it in color or not because they hadn't actually quite appreciated that the work was originally in black and white photographs so there's so there's so much technical uh, aspects to uh, manifesting work like that and she did say at some point that it's the most subtle work that you can imagine yet for her it was a career highlight and that was another thing that I learned that thing that such subtle things that require that labor of love can be the most compelling in a way so uh, so maybe the question for you would be in these past was it 10 years or more um 10 years, yeah, it's 10 years. Don't say or more. I'm amazed that it's 10 years. Yeah. Um, it's quite shocking. It's quite yeah. shocking. That's like I'm sort of actually in a kind of an era, proper era now in the life of the yeah. history of the gallery. Yeah. So, so what's, um, have you had a career highlight like that? Or have you had a moment where you thought that the complexity of something so subtle is revealing so much about um, what it means to practice or show art? Mm. Um, I think I'm I'm probably a little though I've had many moments of revelation and moments that have been in, important um, to me in the in the work in the gallery. Um, but I don't think I value those those more nuanced things as much because I think they're not often so available to people outside of the art world. Um, sorry, I don't mean that to sound critical. It sounds slightly critical, really. But um, I think that these things can be quite um, uh, not always available to audiences and that we can value them in a way as like an inner sanctum of the kind of the, the art world. Um, and um, I, there, are many, there are many conversations that I have actually with audiences or where we review their feedback that I find really revelatory, where they do see relationships between things. And one of the things that I've noticed over time, which is perhaps nuanced in a similar way, uh, that is feels perhaps quite sort of interior um, to my role is, for example, at the moment we're, we're having an exhibition, um, it's called Boundary Encounters, and it's it's very much a, a, a community facing project with led by artists and lots of different pro uh, communities that we work with in Oxford, um, occupying our main gallery spaces. And that's been the first time really in a long time that, that, that we've done that. But what I've noticed is that there's something about, there's a shared, there are many programming relationships that one can draw, but there's also an aesthetic or material um, approach that reoccurs all the time. And perhaps it's to be expected because we're in the same space, but I see many um, echoes across the program in the material, almost archeology span or in impulses of the spaces, certain kinds of forms and shapes and um, uh, even lightings or placement strategies. And this is partly because when I first, when I, I um, took up the position of director, uh, we were planning the 50th anniversary. So I really immersed myself in the archive and looking at the history of the organization. And um, and of course, since I've been there, I've, I've been able to make these connections, but these things feel quite nuanced to me. And I suppose they're running across a whole era, but they suggest another hidden life to the institution, another kind of, a type of subliminal preference in terms of materials and forms that the spaces, and I say this to you, so I guess as an architect, let's say, or someone who's um, comes from that practice, that the, the building has its own kind of logic that feels quite nuanced in that way and that operates almost independent of the, the people that are programming it, not independent of the artists, because I think the artists are, are aesthetically responding to the, the, the space, their working site specifically. I think this is a very nuanced thing, and I suppose I enjoy it for myself because I, I, it enables me to deal with a breadth of reflection around the history of the program and, of course, my own time, the decade that I've um, been director. So it's very nuanced. I've been saying it to the team and they're looking at me slightly blankly, um, but benignly. <laughs> you you're know, saying that what, what you're looking at is not really the moment, but it's more of a line. Yeah, yeah. I think we have to, you know, I'm, I'm really, my, my first degree was really in history. I'm really, 
I'm really interested in the relationship to histories, really. And so even with content, not even with contemporary art, of course, with contemporary art, the thing that I find most fascinating about it is the way that it makes contemporary conditions visible um, and, you know, contemporary technologies visible in relation to histories. That's the thing that I'm really, I find so compelling uh, about it. And that that's a very dynamic kind of, form of time travel so of course my appraisal of the program um carries with it this temporal this durational uh idea of it because i know the program of course it will extend far beyond me as well and at some point like i've been interviewing previous directors someone will be asking me about these things and i'll probably be making lots of things up with the benefit of you know revisionism <laughs> um way down the line so but this temporal aspect of art is actually uh is, is i think where its real agency is and where it's real um for me where its fascination is because i'm very interested in history um, i think that is really fascinating one obvious question for me is how do you capture that you're able to see that because you you are looking at it as a network and as an evolving network but how do you capture that section in time um, that is particularly compelling or that, re that reveals something particularly compelling about the life of an institution or how artists have responded to the space or... Mm. I mean, I think, I mean, on one level, of course, one could do that, you know, in the form of a display. In fact, it's something that if you come to Modern Oxford at the moment, we've got a display in the middle of this exhibition that's all about participation and education, learning work. At modern art Oxford going back to its origins and on one level we've got lots of archival materials and we're making those history visible and actually you can see you see all the cycles that are there like having um strategies in the at a certain moment to pluralize the interpretation by having a range of of uh, like say school children or different community groups as well as curators and artists talking about the program or um, an interdisciplinary turn that happens at a certain point of drawing on the intellectual capital in Oxford, where you've got amazing thinkers, to put other lenses to create more surface area around shows. So you see these strategies um, reoccurring all the time within this display. So I think that's one way in which one can make these things available to audiences that may end up, could have originated in being very nuanced and a bit, a bit hidden. But I think ultimately panning away from that and your the general question, I think that is really for people just to develop their understanding of, of history. Um, because I read modern history uh, at an undergraduate level, I sort of marvel at how people can be in the world and have no idea about history. So how can they make sense of, of the world that we're in now and the conversations around it? But, but I suppose, you know, maybe if I'd studied chemistry or archeology, span I would have just another lens. It's just that mine is really about, is about history. Um, but how were you drawn to art? How were you drawn to an object of art? Because surely that would have at some point uh, been of interest. Oh yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, how did that happen? Gosh, I think objects are just compelling, aren't they? Um, I don't think there's anything as compelling as our relationship with, um, can't do I mean this really? I mean, obviously with people, but with objects, but you know, I think I've just been exposed to too much object on um, orientated ontology or something, I don't know. Uh, mm. But I, I, I have a, I, I find, you know, I've, I have a weird thing about objects, you know, I, I, I feel like they're in the room, you know, and there's certain things that I feel are very present and have energy and, you know, so I think objects, and of course in late capitalism, our relationships with objects is very complicated, very influential um, within the discourse around our social relationships, our sense of identity, and of course, um, the forms that we create. So I think all of that's really fascinating. So I think it's just, I think objects are just, it's just a given that you're interested in, in objects. And of course, historical objects are even more interesting. Um, but all contemporary art was new when it was, all art was new when it was made. So um, these, it, it is, it is the way that objects, artworks become encoded in their own historic moment that I think is, is really fascinating to me. They sort of capture a certain um, time, an ideology, of course, a material set of possibilities. Um, I think those things are, you know, 
I mean, it's obviously, it's like a Bergerian Berge, Berge kind of idea of valuing art, uh, which, which works for me. And also, I mean, like postgraduately, I, you know, studied aesthetics and contemporary visual theory. And I was also really interested in relational theory. And I think that's why I've been so interested in working in public spaces where, um, where of course, those, those um, communal experiences around art and of course, artists' interest in convening those, if that's the right, that's a very clunky expression of it, is, is also really um, important, uh, especially at a moment when we're looking at the relationship between audiences, institutions, artists, and a much wider social and political kind of situation that we're in at the moment, which is super fascinating. Mm. And so when, when this transition happened, when you perhaps started to because obviously art is not just objects. Well, it is, well, it's not. <laughs> um, I mean, even a two-dimensional work is uh, three-dimensional in a way, but, uh, but there is a lot of two-dimensional work that, I, yeah, I guess you can't say it's not an object, but uh, it's just a bit more two-dimensional than three-dimensional. Um, but I wonder whether, there was at any point a specific interest in oh, I'm trying to 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 explore a very specific thing but I, I feel like um, you're uh, resisting or I'm trying to uh, or I can't find the right what about an artist an artist um, what about an interest in in the artist because actually artist is that person that feeds uh, an idea or a meaning into that object, right? They, cre they create the objects. And so artist is maybe this sort of crazy scientist who is conveying this thing. How do you then understand an artist or how do you, or, or at what point are you interested in the psyche of an artist? Oh. Well, I'm I'm very interested in artists. I mean, that's an understatement. Uh, and I think artists, I think artists um, come are like. I mean, artists are individuals. Like everyone is an individual, but perhaps they also um, occupy a space in society which which is permissive of being highly individuated. I think this is a bit of a cliche though around artists. I know lots of artists that are as as um, I know some artists that are as methodical um, and as unflamboyant as any accountant that you might meet, you know, I don't think artists necessarily have to be the psychologically charged, um, uh, eccentric um, uh, agents in our, in our world, you know, I mean, artists come in lots of different shapes and sizes and they're really fascinating. And I'm interested in them as producers of ideas and art forms um, in Oxford, I'm also, there are lots of people that produce ideas. And I think the reason why people are, artists are very interested in working in Oxford actually is because of the, the exchange around ideas. I mean, obviously with the sort of the more conceptual aspects of, of art, the, 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 the importance of ideas I think is, and the increasing jettisoning you know, of the aesthetics around, you know, the dematerial sort of distills us really just down to ideas. And um, ideas are really, uh, are of course, at the heart of, um, of our program and what we're trying to, to do. So, um, but I think that what I would say about artists is that there is no art really without, without um, artists. But in the context of our program, uh, or like if you go to a commercial gallery, or, you know, artists are not always around. They're not, they're not the person that the audience is dealing with. They're, the audiences are thinking about the, the artwork. Um, or the experience in whatever way that is. And as, of course, you're right, it's not objects, it's all sorts of things um, that can now form part of that. So, so the artist, if we predicate the interest of audiences on artists, then we may find that they've gone a bit AWOL often because they're mm -hmm. not in the space. Uh, and, um, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're not always the primary route into the work. Uh, and I think the role of the role of curators, the role of any of us that are, are working to make art available to audiences, you know, we have to play the role to make sure that work is available and accessible to audiences 
And sometimes we have to support artists in that process because an artist will be committed 200% to their vision of what the work mm -hmm. is, and the language and the discourse around it. So we have to negotiate that for audiences quite carefully in out of respect for the work. So so that's a long meander um, around, around uh, the conversation around artists, but no, but artists are, they're really the oxygen of our, of our program. I mean, without a doubt. Uh, and Paul, when you, when you made that uh, move from history to aesthetic history, to working in the world of art, which I understood that was the sort of trajectory, uh, was there a moment that compelled you to, to go there? Was there an exhibition or a work or an artist that at that particular point spoke to you and that sort of guided you uh, in a particular direction? Mm. Well, you'll think me very narrow if I say that it was an exhibition at Modern Art Oxford when I was a student, because I studied at Oxford University and um, I hadn't been to what was then the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford, although I was very interested in art. I think I probably really felt that I didn't at that time understand kind of postmodern, you know, art, and it would, probably would have been a bit beyond me. Still is probably, um, but um, but I remember I remember seeing the John Latham exhibition um, that was at Modern Art Oxford when I was at university, and and I was really really fascinated by Latham's uh, ideas around art. And again, I guess it's going back, I'm sorry, going back to this idea of the, the temporal, the time-based idea of art. But it was so sort of beyond anything I could really understand that I somehow managed to show an extent of some inquiry that, that was so radically interesting that I, I cite that as, as a very important um, exhibition for me. And I would have been about 18 or 19 at that time. And, you know, being aware of things like the artist placement group, obviously with John Latham and this idea of, of the artist, again, radically different. The idea of an artist working in that kind of context, an incidental person, a person without a brief, a person that was, um, was able to, yeah, work, in a community to create forms of culture that it just it just and even still I think actually when you think of the artist placement group and the work of you know Barbara Stavini and Flanagan and all the Latham and others uh, it's really it's actually really still very radical to just realize quite how pioneering that work was in the 70s and the 80s and how it set the kind of the framework for all these resident like residences and an idea of arts agency away from the white cube. I mean, I'm using these shortcuts to theory, obviously. Um, so that was, I would say that was a very important exhibition um, uh, for me in, in just sort of realizing there was a whole world here to discover, you know, especially at that age when you, you've read art history and you've gone through the various movements and, you know, going back to the Renaissance or whatever it is that you're doing within an art history degree. I didn't do an art history degree, but I was able to study art history within my degree. And uh, I just realized there was a whole world of stuff that I didn't know about, you know? And did you think this is very good or did you think this is very interesting? And so what was the, what, what was, followed? I was completely baffled by it, but I sensed, I sensed that, that this was a conversation that could go in so many different directions. If you were if you were radically redefining what the what an art object could be, um, and this idea that it could be essentially an event, um, and and it has I suppose it did sow the seeds for interest that I've had really about these more relational, um, uh, communal, experiential encounters that are let's say convened by artists. I know there's been a big discourse around around uh, the role of artists in the convening of these spaces and how the, the political ideology of these spaces and you know all of this, which I'm also quite interested in, in because of the perceived inclusiveness of these types of practices. Um, uh, but, um, but I think, um, yeah, I, th I think that I could definitely, I had not thought about this actually, so thank you. I can definitely see a thread there that has continued in my interests 
in, in work, uh, in practices that, that... I think I think it's very, it's very, actually John Latham is such a, it explains what you've been saying yes. you know, for the past like half an hour, because actually uh, that way of thinking of diluting, well, actually even diluting the artist as a kind of main agent, or allowing the surroundings to sort of inform uh, where the work will go yeah. in some way explains your um, your approach actually i think you're also talking to me as the director of a public institution at a particular moment when institutions have moved much more uh, again it's a binary but let's say on a spectrum there's been a significant shift towards um, uh, audience-centric approaches and away from a kind of authorial, curatorial position towards more collectively devised uh, programs and valuing the institution as a convener of a conversation around art. So of course that's talking to relational theory. It's also talking to the politics of institutions. Um, it doesn't... Um, uh, I want to be really clear that um, my interest in artists is absolutely, you know, artists are central in the com in, in this. But I, but I, but at the moment, I'm more interested in talking about this other dynamic because I think that I think that feels more more current uh, and a more um, something that is uh, specific to a kind of an institution like Modern Art Oxford. Um, and, and artists, I think, and curators within that, I think are finding a place that is, is very, uh, is very particular. Uh, there's certain practices that I think are becoming a moving center stage. There's a discourse around that as well. And, you know, I just think it's, um, this is, I think, something that is, is really defining of the, the nature of institutions uh, in public institutions, I think, in Britain at the moment. So that sounds rather pompous, but I think I know enough of my peers to say that we're all thinking and talking about these sorts of these questions um, and what they mean for artists and what they mean, for example, for curators, uh, if we are all moving towards more inclusive, more representative, more participatory, rather than away from authored spaces where we do a program because we think people should be interested in it. Those days, I mean, some people may still be doing that to differing degrees, but I think that we're institutions are moving much more towards this former model. Do you see that yourself or not? I do. I absolutely do. And it's been a question that I've asked before people that uh, lead institutions. I've asked about institutional authority, and it, that has been a difficult, um, it's always been rejected this notion of authority, even though I do feel like institutions still have a form of authority, that is what in some way distinguishes them from maybe less organized forms of uh, dissemination of work. But it, what you're saying maybe to me is saying that that authority is, has, is changing its form I struggle to believe that it's disappearing. Yeah, who, I'd be interested to know who was saying that it is disappearing, because I think it's just shifting shape and, um, and perhaps it's being, it's being more porous to its, uh, and accountable to, and recognizing the opportunities of having closer creative relationships with audiences. And this of course is where the impact for artists and for curators comes into play. Um, there are many artists of course, who are really interested in working in those spaces. Um, and there are curators as well that are obviously really interested in working in that way. But I think for traditional models of say curator, cu curatorship that have been more authorial, um, there, there may be, yeah, lots of things to be reflecting upon there because I think programming is now much more collaborative, and um, and I think that's a, that's a significant uh, shift, I believe, um, in the the values and also the programs of um, of institutions. But I still think institutions are are very influential. They're where the 
in collection, they're still where the story of the the story of the history of art is sort of um, deeply problematically, but that's where it's held, and that's where people audiences engage with that um, that story, and they are still the primary space where artists have relationships with audiences, and I think that's that's why they're so important for the relationship between artists and institutions is incredibly important. Um, so I, I I would I would disagree with an idea that institutions are are um, are not important or influential. I think that they're they're under siege. Mm. Um, yes, I think it was. It's not. It's, it's actually more my impression that it, it wasn't that anyone in particular said that uh, they're losing authority, or it was actually my impression that they're not acknowledging their authority or trying to. Uh, mm possibly yeah. yeah yeah that's i think that's possible because i think that you know there's um quite rightly public institutions are publicly funded mm -hmm. and they have to uh, be accountable to the general public and that public they have to be really uh fit for purpose for the wide spectrum of contemporary society and frankly they're not um they try to be i would even say they claim to be um, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, rhetoric around inclusion and diversity, but I think many, many organisations don't reflect that diversity in their, for example, their audiences. Um, uh, it doesn't, you know, reflect that. And I, I would say Modern Oxford doesn't reflect that. There are lots of things that we're doing. The easiest thing that you can do is actually to have a very diverse programme, to programme in that way. But that doesn't mean that you have um, uh, th those developed audiences that are diverse in that way. Uh, the best way to do that is to work with those communities that you're not reaching and then say, what should we, you know, let's have a creative collaborative conversation that might enable us to be more relevant uh, to, to, at the moment, unreached uh, communities and audiences. So, mm. but that's a very particular skill set. And, um, uh, so, you know, I'm talking through some of the slightly more pragmatic aspects of programming in terms of audience uh, development. Um, but yeah, look, yeah. There is something about the size of the institution. So a smaller institution is perhaps more agile, a larger institutions where the governors are appointed by the government are perhaps trickier to transform. But then they also have more authority yeah but they're also in a way more vulnerable because they are also more accountable and they've got you know more cultural capital so i think it's um i think it's very it's very complicated my, my experience of range running a range of really different organizations over the years is that often um think problems just get scaled up you know this is it's the same situation because there's never enough money and the economy around the production of art is what it is in the public uh, kind of sphere. Um, and, and, and these problems just get magnified the bigger the organization that you are, but then you may have more resources, but actually the, the complexity of things just gets a bit bigger. Things just get scaled up. That's a very reductive way of describing it. And that impacts our ability to well, or the ability within those institutions to experiment, to fail, to uh, yeah. do something very risky um, yeah. in terms of programming or something that doesn't fall under any category, under any established category. And that's quite problematic, I feel. I think institutions have their own way of taking risks and some, are, some have a, um, a very clear purpose in doing that. And uh, and then I think others, you know, ultimately, um, you you know, you want to have you want to have a, a strong program that a lot of people enjoy, and um, programming for the art world is is one thing, but programming for general audiences is another. And you know, you speak to curators uh, in big institutions that they will have, you know, they'll have they'll have audience targets, you know. It's like we want to get half a million people to come into our building this year, devise a program that will achieve that. So that's that would be if I were interviewing a curator tomorrow, I would probably ask them that would be my first interview question. Um, talk, talk us through your program for Oxford that will achieve audiences of half a million a year. 
And that's, you know, because ultimately programming is something but then that, you end up, but then you end up with your Yoi Kusama everywhere. <laughs> well, this is this is the day, yeah, this is the the danger, isn't it? Um, you know, and also the challenge, the exciting challenge, which is to, you know, maybe you end up with a Ruth Asawa show that's like super popular, for example. So um, but we wouldn't want to have a Ruth Asawa show every um every schedule we also want to have a jesse darling show because jesse's talking about really other things that other people are interested in so um i think the thing i'm thinking a lot about at the moment is like how within a really strong inclusion agenda you can create forms of exclusion uh, where people feel that maybe your program isn't for them because it's really focusing on sort of feminism or you know I mean 70% of, of our audiences and I think it's true for lots of other institutions are you know primarily female they might be 65 to 70% uh, female but it's like okay do we want to have a conversation about contemporary masculinity in our program where's that is that that's a topic why are we not talking about that in our program you know so I think again going back to like relation of well the political sort of uh critique around relational theory, like Chantal Mouffe and people like this, you know, we should be a space that, that can be defined not by consensus, but actually by the degree of, of, of um, tolerable difference that we can convene. That's really, that's, I think, very important. If you're going to say you're inclusive and you're trying to be for as many people that fund you as possible, which is an important part of the argument for programming, you do need to think about who you're talking to with an inclusion agenda, and also who you're maybe deprioritizing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, again, a sort of a bit of a meandering thought, but I think these, I think these things are very influential at the moment in the thoughts of institutions, because uh, if you look at most people, most organizations programs now, they're starting to look sort of quite similar yeah. um, in lots of ways. And this cultural homogeneity, I think is, is interesting. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of reflecting to be done on on this this particular moment of uh, of of cultural production mm. around inclusion. Mm. And and if we zoom out, or or in fact, if we well, it's interesting because this is maybe a way of zooming out and in at the same time. But if we look at the role of a curator, is one thing that particularly fascinates me is that role. And I, I don't know whether you see yourself as a curator. I mean, it's a, do you? I've curated lots of shows, but I don't define myself as a curator. Um, uh, as a, yeah, uh, um, there are other things. I mean, I've enjoyed making exhibitions um, and some people I think want to continue to make exhibitions for as long as possible. But for me, um, there were other, I, I quite enjoy all the aspects of leading the institution, but um, but I've certainly curated a lot of shows over the years. The curator is a very uh, peculiar to me position because, I mean, now there might be courses, a uh, bachelor a degree in curation. I don't know. Th th I don't know if that exists. But there, it's something that it's not sort of profiled as a profession, yet th there is an element of authority that comes with it because the curator is the person that decides certain things. And so what context, Marco, are you talking there? Because, again, I think these things are changing. I don't yeah. think you have curators going into organizations and saying, right, this is my program in that sort of non self-referential. I'm interested in this kind of program. Um, I, I don't know that that's still I think that's quite an old model of of curators in institutions. Yes, well, well, I guess that's the, that that might well be the question: is what is the what is the model? Um, and so, if you are interviewing a curator tomorrow, what is that person going to be responsible for? And sh sure, there is a uh, th there is a, all sorts of technical things that they'll be expected to deliver and coordinate. But in terms of their creative output and their ability to shape something, where is, where is that in terms of list of priorities? Mm. 
I think it's still there. It's just that it's perhaps achieved more collaboratively. Mm. Um, people are working across teams and, you know, they're maybe working more closely with their education or participation teams. And um, maybe they might be, uh, I mean, I don't know, I guess I'm speaking a lot from my own experience at Modern Art Oxford. I mean, obviously you've got lots of very different types of curators. You've got collection curators that have got deep knowledge in the collections that in whole, you know, in the holdings of the collections that they have. That's one form of curating. You've got contemporary, you've got um, obviously other kinds of curators that are working in a context like Tate uh, or, or the Chisholm Gallery. I mean, they're all very different kinds of roles. Uh, when you're working often with a contemporary artist, as you may know from your own experience, um, often as the curator, you're you're sort of there as a support, as an assistant. You know, it's like um, helping to to realise the show with the artist. And many of the key decisions will quite rightly be taken by the artist in conversation. So all of these, I think, what's really critical in 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 contemporary curatorship today. Uh, is, is this ability to work effectively with other people um, and not just the artist. Perhaps at one point that primary relationship might have been the artist and the curator. And the show might have then been, you know, the curator would mediate the show with the voice of the artist, let's say conventionally. Uh, I think that um, what's most important is an ability to be able to work across teams to ensure that an artist's exhibition is effective and successful across the board. It's popular to audiences, it's accessible to audiences. It's, um, it's you know, there's a huge range of other pragmatic things like um, uh, accessibility and sensory information and, you know, uh, health and safety and safeguarding. There's so many other things that are now important because if you want to have as many people coming to your exhibitions as possible you need to make sure that you're thinking about neurodiverse people um and uh, or like what the you know if the artist is wanting to have the galleries as dark as possible and you've got your neurodiverse stakeholder group saying we can't have walking no one wants to walk into a a gallery full of strangers in the pitch dark you know there are lots of things that need to be negotiated um in the in the effective realization of the program and the curator is really central in negotiating those relationships all of those demands on an exhibition um uh just, you know, aside from ensuring that the exhibition is the most ambitious, excellent um, realization of the artist's designs. It's a, it's a role of negotiation. It's a role of interpersonal skills, as well, of course, as like having a, um, a strong art historical and, you know, conceptual uh, mm -hmm. knowledge. I mean, all of these things are important. So it's a very, it's a very complicated role. Um, and it's one that in very in different contexts is very different. Um, so, but I but I, what I don't think it is is someone who um, becomes uh, knowledgeable about contemporary art and then just says, "I'm really interested in a program of X, Y, and Z artists," without any reference beyond their own interest in those artists. And I don't think that I think that that type of perhaps is a perhaps there's a fallacy amongst new curators that, that that very privileged authorial position is one that they will move into. But I think that the, I think that's changed a lot. It's changed a lot, yet there has been a, again, like curation as a university degree has emerged as such. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that's a bit of a contradiction. Yeah, but that happened, you know, those, those those degrees have been around for 20, nearly 30 years now. I mean, the Royal College of Art course was set up in the late nine, or I think maybe the early noughties. Um, so that's already nearly a quarter of a century ago. Um, so I think that 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 professionalization of the role of the curator, which of course was accompanied by at the same time this huge interest, suddenly from nowhere. Um, on the back of the YBAs and Tate Modern and contemporary art was suddenly de rigueur. Everyone was sort of wanting to be in contemporary art, including myself. You know, I went to work at the Serpentine Gallery at that moment, um, was working at the Royal Academy when the sensation show. I was very shaped by that. That was the moment when I did uh, um, an m in critical theory around contemporary art because I was also really excited um, in, in that, but that's produced a generation of, it's been very inf influential in creating a generation of professional curatorial practice that didn't exist previous 
to it because it wasn't recognized as something that was um, was needed in the same way, perhaps. Um, I think it was, there was a much more, people that worked with artists before to realize shows, they were much more kind of, uh, what's the word? Um, rigorous, but sort of, they didn't have this professional identity that the curator has now. And that is very, is very aspirational for many people uh, that want to work in the, you know, in the art world. Um, How do we reconcile that, that uh, frenzy about potential uh, career and professionalization of a curator has educated a generation of curators, um, yet it has, it's also questioned itself as a form of practice or, so are we, do you think that education should change or do you think it is changing or do you think um, maybe it shouldn't really exist? I think it's I think it's a di again another very dynamic kind of field of practice, and um, the other thing I would add is that, you know, when you when you travel internationally as as you will do, and you're in let's say Munich as I was in June, and you're at the Haus der Kunst, and you're talking to curators, and they're like, oh yeah, actually, you know, I did the curating course at Goldsmiths, so I did the curating course, you know, it's also been this platform for the international development of curatorial practice and and. A network so it's enormously influential beneficial uh, these courses to the field of um, contemporary curating I mean there's no doubt about that but I am aware that within all of these um, programs and also within conversations that curators are having through institutions and on their own self-organized uh, fora um, that they're talking about this they're talking about how the role of the curator is changing and and they are I think um, thinking about the not so much just the theory of art, but also the application of of um, of what programming is. Um, and program it may be really attractive to think that we're programming the things that we're interested in, mm -hmm. um, but but I, I think that that's not. I don't think that's the role of the curator um, in the public arena. And I think, and I know because I, I'm part of these. You know, I go and give these talks and talk about these things, and we do lots of um curatorial mentorship and you know we're always stressing that because to have a career it's really useful for curators to develop a range of of skills um that are also around how to make an arts council application and you know um or how to produce a publication uh, so there are lots of things you know that are part of that of that um that conversation um and how to deal with the huge amounts of administration that's involved Mm, also, presumably, connections to different fields. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. The field of architecture, you might have a completely different um, angle or an understanding of how something can be conceptualized or realized. Yeah, no, abso absolutely. I mean, I think that I think it, to me, it's the more the more versatile someone is as a curator, the more porous they are, the more open they are to collaboration and exchange the more um, dynamic, the more relevant um, they will be as curators. And, and that's true for any, also true for any institution. You know, the, the, more, the more inclusive we, we are, the more collaborative we are, the more relevant we will be to a wide range of people. And, um, and you know, and curators play a role in that. Um, but there are many, many other people that play a role in that. Um, our front of house team, our gallery invigilators, they're the people really that are having the conversation with audiences. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, my curators aren't standing in the galleries all day having those conversations, it's our invigilators. You know, it's, um, it's the marketing and interpretation teams that are driving audiences and how they talk about the show. Um, so, uh, as I say, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm minimizing the importance of the curator. I'm not, I'm saying that that role is like the artist at the center of everything. But the, but the relationships that are built around it are, are much more interesting now. Uh, they're more comprehensive. They need to be more inclusive and they need to be more collaborative. And as you've said, there are different types. I mean, that's another thing that I've learned and encounter different, really different types of curators. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really talking about, you know, obviously um, the context of modern Oxford and, and many organizations that I think 
Um, I know from my conversations with other directors of similar organizations, um, but, but yes, of course, if you, if you talk to a curator at Tate, they'll have a different, because of the different departments and specialisms and the scale, they'll probably have a more focused program uh, around that. And their interpretation, I know, is actually done by, a you know, they'll do the curatorial rationale, but then there's another team that will write about, the, you know, for the show. Yeah. And I think they write, you know, from the point of view of being an eight-year-old visitor. So it can be as inclusive and as accessible as possible. And mm. so even that bit of the curatorial interpretation is a shift to another department. So all of these relationships in institutions, I think, um, are, are, are very interesting um, and very skilled. They require a great deal of skill on the part of curators for very little money, um, unfortunately, as we know. Um, so I think, yeah, I think Oxford, Oxford itself being, I actually, I studied uh, architecture at Oxford Brooks. Oh. Um, so I did live in Oxford for three years and it really is a beautiful place, but it is a bit of a non-place. Yeah. I can't agree to that, of course, but I, I'm, yes, I'm you here to hear your elaboration. Well, I'm happy for you to just disagree and tell me why you disagree. I think the, the reason why I always felt, as you said, there's so many, uh, there's so many tourists, there's so many students, which presents uh, probably amazing opportunities, but it's a transitory place. And so I wonder what kind of institution or what kind, how do you approach that? Mm. I guess I wonder how do you approach that tr transitory quality of Oxford in guiding an institution which is in the middle of it. And it's also such a, yeah, anyway, that's another, you know, when I first went to Modern Art Oxford, I couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah, this is a common problem. It's such an elusive, a transitory as well, right? In that sort of uh, transitory space. Yeah, we're, we're in a, you're completely right. We're, we're in quite a marginal space and many people spend, say if they're students or if we're talking about students at the universities, then they can spend three years and never even know that we're there. And we have to tell every new generation of students yeah. that we're there, it's like ground, we're constantly doing that because otherwise if we just forget to do that or, or just run out of steam doing that, then it's likely that people will never know uh, students may not know that we're there. So it is a very transitory place. Um, we have, you know, 7 million tourists coming and going all the time, day trippers. We've got all the academic staff, the student populations, lots of people that are there because of the, you know, maybe they were living in London or Basel or, and they're coming there because of the schools. So people are coming and going all the time. And, um, and again, it contributes to this sense of, of the temporal, you know, this idea of, the, and you know, establishing a, a recurring theme, uh, you know, that people are there, we have an exchange, it's in a moment, they move on. But the number of people that I've also spoken to that have come back and said, oh, you know, I remember that show, I went to Monarchs, you know, I saw that show, when was that? You know, they always think it was last year and it was five years ago, you know, or whenever. Uh, I think is, I think is another sort of opportunity. It's another kind of distributed influence because Oxford is very internationally connected. Mm. Uh, it's very close to London, which is beneficial, but it's also sits within its own distinct uh, sense of place. And it is one of the world's great centers for thinking and learning. And that's, that draws artists and curators. Um, and we, we are really enriched by the intellectual capital uh, um, of the city. And so mm. I think, and, and with our audiences, people often don't get art, I find, in Oxford. I mean, I've been around the block long enough to be able to, to say that. Uh, but, they, but many people do get ideas. They do get ideas. And I think that the more lenses we can put around our program, the, the more interdisciplinary, the more plural it can be in terms of ways in, that does something really dynamic to the fixed content of the program because it creates more surface area for conversations. It becomes like a Trojan horse for talking to people about art when they think you're talking to them about chemistry or history, you know, if that makes sense. So I think Oxford is a really remarkable place. It, is. Um, it really is. I, I, I think it is. Um, I do, well, 
when I was thinking about talking to you, my first instinct was to think about this transitory quality of Oxford. There's something unsettling about it, you know, <laughs> because people come and go and yet you're, you're there preserving uh, this space. Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Maybe, maybe that's what puts a heightened attachment to the the history and the program of the gallery and the art, some of the things I've talked about, maybe that maybe we use that as a sort of fixture in a very transitory and dynamic. Um, Which is always the nature of every university town. I think that's what university town is. It's this place that is in a constant motion in some way. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's right. But I also think that it's, you know, it's inevitable that curators and directors, you know, they come into these new institutions and they're very forward looking. They're wanting to establish a, a program, move things forward. It tends to be a tendency to look forward. Um, and, you know, I think that I think that there is uh, because I'm sort of at heart a historian, many things that can be enriched from history. Uh, that can enable us to, if not make sense of the present, at least give us a space in which to convene conversations around contemporary conditions. And to do that with artists who are such researchers in making things, I, don't, I, I guess I don't just mean specifically visible, but let's say making things available to understand our relationship to the world at this very particular moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are the things that I find really exciting. I want that to be as wide a conversation as possible. And I want it to be something that is, um, is not fixed. And it's not fixed by the artist, actually. Um, it, you know, it's fixed by a set of really sort of circumstantial, discursive um, opportunities mm -hmm. in which artists play the leading role. Mm -hmm. um, but Again, my experience of artists is that they're, they, they're primarily interested to know what people think about their, their ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the most open, mm -hmm. I think, to that. And I think we can learn a lot from artists, actually, mm -hmm. about that openness to audiences, because they, they really want to know what audiences think about, about their work. And they want to expand audiences all the time. Yeah, but they, they're like... You know, I, and I've had I've done so many shows at Modern Oxford now, and, with, and you're there with the artist, and they're so, on one level, it's terrifyingly exposing, as you know, to do a, an ex, a solo exhibition and to hear what people think about it. It's such bravery, really, um, to do that. And, and, and yet artists put themselves, at, I mean, and we can say this consistently, I think, about artists. They are courageous in putting themselves into those public conversations and that public judgment and, you know, for better or worse, but they're always primarily concerned to know whether or not audiences have enjoyed their show, if it's been a popular show or, you know, has the press written, you know, they want to know what people think about their work. And I think that's human nature, not just artists, it's human nature, really. So what was it like bringing Marina Branovich to uh, Oxford? How did that resonate with the, with the place? Well, of course, you know, Marina had a show when she was a relatively mid-career sort of art. Did you know this in the artist? Yeah, she had a show in the mid-90s, I want to say 96, I think, and um, was, was, was not a well-known artist, but is one of those moments in the perform. you know, Yoko Ono wasn't long after that or before that, I can't remember, um, of, of um, focusing on performance-based practices. And... Um, and and so we want we wanted to bring Marina back. We were interested in in um, a type of return with Marina, where some of the collections which had been continue to be so influential on her, for example, the Pitt Rivers collection in Oxford, something that she cited over a long period of time as being really foundational for her in her research. At a certain moment in her career, we wanted to revisit. Um, her practice with her and she made a really extraordinary work a very challenging work um, from which we learned a great deal but a really um, it was a, a new work that she made for us in which the artist wasn't present if you'll forgive the pun um, the artist was absent and um, and was and Marina was a complete joy to work with I don't know if you know her at all I briefly remember 
she's in, she's incredibly generous, mm. humble, very um, what's the word? Very collaborative. Mm -hmm. Valued everyone in the team. You know, from like the front of house team, all the invigilators, the practitioners that were trained in the Abramovich method, all the way across the organization. She was she was a complete joy to work with. Um, and we were honored to work with her given her stature now um, uh, in Oxford. And, I, and it was very much coming out of her uh, affection for the institution on the base of a, a basis of a long relationship with it. Um, I don't think even Marina would have been generous enough, despite the fact that she is, to have accepted an invitation from us, well, not Oxford, to work with her at this stage in her career. So we were very humble to work with her and it was a really joyful experience. And it was a very challenging exhibition, a very interesting exhibition. And we learned a lot from it because it, because it gave, it created a set of responsibilities with our audiences that needed to be quite carefully managed because the show was all about focusing on the interior of the subject. So less so on the exchange with Marina. Um, and of course, in that totally un, uh, unexplored space, all sorts of things surfaced for our visitors. And so it was a very interesting uh, learning experience as well as a very strong um, uh, show in, in my view. And was there a connection to the 1990s piece or work that she did there? Um, only insofar as again, Marina was interested in looking at the uh, Tibetan, the, Buddhan, the Buddhist holdings, the, the amazing holdings that they have at, um, uh, the Pitt Rivers, and we hosted a residency. So Marina had been with us for uh, a month the summer before, and she was able to have access to the materials with um, with Professor Claire Harris, who you may or may not know, is the professor of anthropology, but is like a world renowned expert in um, these these holdings. And um, and I, I guess that's the thing. Of course, you know, that exists in lots of cities, this expertise, but actually in Oxford, there really, there really, you know, you have to almost search hard to find someone who doesn't have some form of, of really interesting expertise in the worlds of the universities. Um, uh, I'm obviously not talking about Oxford as a, as a city, it also has lots of other interesting things about it. It's also one of, has some of the most deprived wards in England in Oxford, which again is perhaps surprising for people that have a certain image of it. Um, but um, yeah, so she she returned to the Pitt Rivers collection. That was a point of continuity that uh, that she was very keen on and that we were, because we wanted to mark a kind of return. And that's how that was achieved through the conceptual territory of the show. Mm -hmm. And did you feel that it did um, permeate through, again, may, maybe more permanent parts of the city, uh, Oxford as place, um, did it reach those audiences that you were hoping to? I'm going to just be severe on myself and say that we there's more that we can do, we need to do in our programme to reach um, uh, audiences that are not, for whom we're not on our radar. Mm. And that's, when I say that, I guess I mean that no matter what we programme, people just think that modern art Oxford is not a place for them. Um, and this is a problem that, again, is not obviously specific to modern Oxford. Um, people don't, you know, they just, there may be posters all around the city, but they're not, they're not, it's like white noise. They just think, what is that? That's not, and being called modern art Oxford, you know, <laughs> these are not necessarily, uh, they don't scream kind of inclusion also. So there are lots of things that, that we need to keep working on. But again, benefiting and perhaps revealing the, my interest in the temporal, we're a work in progress. We will always be a work in progress. There are things that I think are, are working really well and other things that we need to get better at. Um, and, and having um, more diverse audiences is something that's really important uh, for us without a doubt. But the way that, but having said that through our participation um, programs, you know, we work with, thousands and thousands of, of people that, that are harder to reach and, and we do that work with them and then we invite them into 
our curatorial programming teams, those people, you know, we have a, a team of young creatives, mm -hmm. young people, and they, with the curator, they devise the program. So it's not, you see, this is why I keep talking about this, the role of the curator in within working with stakeholder groups and being more collaborative and, you know, or, or, or doing the very courageous thing, as courageous as artists showing, and, and seeding up space to those groups to program. You know, these are, you know, in a supported way. So these are the, some of the sorts of things that um, we're doing at Modern Oxford, and I know that other institutions are, are doing. But of course, that radically shifts maybe the motivation or the skill set for someone who's training a, the RCA to be a curator. Um, so, but I know that those courses stay very close to professional, you know, people that are running these spaces and have these kinds of conversations all the time, um, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, no, it does. It does. Um, I'll continue to reflect on this. I, I, there's obviously that question of, you know, setting priorities and which are to do with inclusion and, and expansion. But sometimes I just look at some of those institutional statements that in some way are quite in their openness, they also <laughs> um, exclude. So, I, I mean, it's uh, in a way like we, this is not necessarily part of the conversation. I think we... No, it is. Marco, you're right. This is the point I was making earlier around truly inclusive spaces should be marked by the degree of difference and dissent that they can tolerate, not by um, an exclusively liberal consensual space. Now I can say that as point of principle, um, but then we also have a responsibility if we're bringing different groups in that have got different, different views on the world, different ideologies, let's say, if we're convening those, those people because we want to be really porous and relevant and to have convers difficult conversations because we are, believe that art is a progressive agent of social change, because that's really what that involves doing. We, we can't have um, a situation where someone is saying, well, I don't want to have a group of incel men in our building, you know. I get that. I don't particularly want to hang out with in incel men myself, but it is discriminatory. We are a public space. We have to think about, you know, the widest demographic of our of our audiences. And as you say, if people look at our program and they don't see themselves reflected in it or, rel or it being relevant to them, um, even if they're looking at our program, then, you know, we have to we have to ask ourselves the really difficult questions. So I think part of what I've been talking to you about really is thinking through the strategies around programming and the responsibilities around programming that are um, that anyone who is running a public institution is, is thinking about. Programming isn't something, an exercise in isolation. It's about kind of achieving a mission and a purpose and, um, and for, for, for a group of people, you know. And, um, and so if I'm talking to the curator and they're proposing a certain show, my first question is, why? Why that show? There are loads of Mexican emerging artists. Why that show? Why that artist? You know, why now? Who's it interesting to? Why is it interesting? What's the conversation about? So on and so forth. And then it's like, how does this map onto our participatory work? What are the opportunities there? Are there different communities that might, you know, you start, it's all always a series of whys. Um, and that's what's, it's the challenge and the rigor of that, that actually is, I find really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, not, the, not the authorial simplicity of just saying, I'm really interested in this artist and let's do a show. It's like, who are you doing the show for? You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for um, for a range of audiences. Mm. You po you use the word programming a lot, and and I think that it's a nice word because it suggests that it's um, that it's a menu of things. That it isn't just one thing, and it is something that is in time. So it suggests more voices than just one. Yeah, I mean, you know, our program ranges around obviously exhibitions and displays, 
We also have all of the participatory projects and related outcomes from that, which might be displays or publications and working with different groups, community groups or schools, students. Um, we also have a really extensive digital um, program that is much, is very uh, socially engaged. It's a space where some of the consequences or the social kind of implications of, of our program can have a more discursive interactive platform with audiences um, and we do digital commissions alongside that as well as publications and then a live program um, talk seminars gigs poetry readings residencies so there are lots and lots of things that form part of the the program and our programming is 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 like mostly free mm -hmm. uh, mostly free but we've started because of of a need which, and we've not talked at all about the, the other drivers around the values of institutions like policy or like funding, which of course are actually probably even more influential. Um, but, you know, in order to diversify income streams in a situation of falling public subsidy, um, you have to look at how you can monetize your cultural assets. And part of that is things like producing limited editions or having ticket revenues or, hiring out parts of your building or developing a patron scheme. And all of these things require their own resourcing. Um, and then the Arts Council with that will also have a whole set of criteria around the outcomes for its own funding. So you can spend probably more time talking about all of those things, even sometimes than the amount of time you have to give to programming is relatively straightforward compared to the, yeah. compared to running a cafe you know <laughs> actually running a cafe is an operational um what's the word challenge 